happy Sabbath, church. Oh, you can do better than that. Come on now, if you had a good week, you ate good all week, nobody's starving. Good morning, happy Sabbath. Okay, that sounds so much better. I'm glad that you all had a good week, because I had a good week. You know, um, preparing for today, it took a lot of energy, sleepless nights. You know, because I want to make sure that I had something to share with you all, something that you all could relate to. You know, I think that every message that is given should be something that the congregation as well as the speaker know how, have experienced, can relate to. So my topic this morning, training days, based on what Alicia sung this morning, Still I Rise, Dawkins in his intercessory prayer, spoke on challenges. And then Larry came with this song, The Lord is in His Holy Temple. Think about it. Still I rise, no matter what you're going through. Dawkins spoke about challenges. But remember, the Lord is still in His holy temple. He's not dead. God is alive. All right? So, I need for you all to stand with me this morning as we do our scripture this morning, all right? Because you know I don't speak long, so don't get too comfortable. You're going to miss something, okay? I just say what I got to say, let the Lord have his way, and then we say amen and go home, okay? So, <laughs> our scripture this morning, all right, is Proverbs, the 15th chapter, verses 1 through 7. As you read this, I want you to think about the words, all right? Because this has a lot to do with our training, all right? So let's read this together. Proverbs 15, chapter, verses 1 through 7, all right? It says, all together, a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. The tongue of the wise uses knowledge rightly, but the mouth of fools pour forth foolishness. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. A fool despises his father's instructions, but he who receives correction is prudent. The lips of the wise disperse knowledge, but the heart of the fool does not do so. Let us pray. Our dear most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, this is your day. You've taken us through six days, Lord. Us trying to rise. The challenges. But through it all, Lord, you're still in your holy temple. You sit high, Lord, and you see everything that's happening, everything that's going on, Lord. You just, act, you, just, you just told us to continue to trust in you. Our understanding of your works, Lord, we don't know. But it's where the faith that comes in. Help us, Lord Jesus. Be in the midst of these words that will be spoken, that it may give us guidance. It will continue to give us purpose. And most of all, a direction to better serve you. In your name we do ask and pray. Amen. You may be seated. So the title of my message today is called Training Days, all right? What are God's training methods in your life? Think about that for a moment. The Lord has created ways to train us in order to prepare us for his purpose, okay? He teaches us new skills, a new attitude, and a new way of interacting with people. God uses time, circumstances, and people to sharpen us in self-control and patience. Have you ever thought about that? Just when we think we have arrived spiritually, he asks us to love the difficult, unconditionally people that come into our life. God's training ground can be rough, difficult, and strenuous. God's preparation includes what to do as well as what not to do. We can learn from other people's wisdom, love, and patience. These individuals inspire us to do better. On the other hand, we can learn from those who cause hurt, rejection, or oppression among the sheep. 
through, th through them, God instructs us not to imitate them. Our challenge is when we are faced with these tough people to not get appalled nor get offended by the person. If we love them dearly, we will have a tendency to justify their actions. If we, if we see it for what it is, then we can learn what not to do. Let me share with you two illustrations from the Bible, all right? There was Ruth through Naomi's faith. This is found in Ruth uh, uh, chapters 1 through 4. Ruth became a widow at a young age. She was, she was also barren with no children from her marriage. Ruth was a Moab, Moabite who did not know but learned about God from her mother-in-law, Naomi. While Ruth had a disappointing beginning, she did not doubt Naomi's God because Ruth didn't know who God was, but through Naomi, she found out who God was. After the passing of all the men in the household, Ruth chose to go with Naomi to her homeland and serve her mother-in-law without any expectations for her future. She wasn't following a dream. She just loved Naomi and Naomi's God. Check this out, church. She was following a woman who had been a great example of faith to her. Naomi's actions proved who she was. Ruth chose to serve her mother-in-law without the fear of sacrificing her future. She came as a servant in the field of Boaz, and she gleaned in his fields as a poor person. Ruth didn't have much to hang on to, but she anchored her faith in Naomi's God. The Lord, in turn, used her mother-in-law and Boaz to bless her with a marriage, a home, and a baby. God provided for her needs and desires. Her son was the grandfather of King David. God has a way of turning what appears to be a bad situation into a message for us today. This is why we must trust God unconditionally, not lean to our own understanding of things, okay? And then there's Samuel through Eli's flawed relationship. Check this out, church. Hannah, who was a, a, a Samuel's mother, she brought her son Samuel and dedicated him to the temple to be trained and raised by Eli. Eli was the priest, okay? Eli was the priest and a judge, and he knew God's voice. On the other hand, Eli's sons were wicked, bad boys. Over the years, Eli and his sons were priests of the Lord. Eli had not shown accountability and responsibility in connecting or restraining his sons, okay? They committed sin and unlawful practices as a lifestyle at the temple. Samuel was trained at an early age to hear God's voice under Eli's leadership. He also learned that just because Eli heard and discerned God's voice well, it didn't mean that he led well as a father or a priest. Listen, church. Eli's household was out of order. These circumstances prepared Samuel for what was coming next. He became the messenger of a strong prophetic word that God sent to Eli about his sons. While Samuel learned how to hear God's voice well through Eli, he did not idolize Eli. When the time came that God had a message to deliver to Eli, he could have said to the Lord, well, Lord, I owe my life to Eli. He, you know, he brought me up and everything like that, all right? But he could have also said, could you pick someone else to deliver the word? On the contrary, though, Samuel delivered the powerful and potent message in its entirety. Samuel learned to have a realistic view of responsibility accountability, and consistency over the years. He was willing to place Saul in leadership when God asked him to do it. When Saul became rebellious, he was able to move and anoint David as the next king. Samuel had learned and leaned on God and hear his voice as well. 
he also had matured to the realization that whether he is under a priest or a king, one of them is only human. Respect the position, but don't rever the person. He was, he was able to discern the good and the bad in their leadership. He stayed objective and open to God's leading, and as a result, he remained useful for God, purpose, through his years of service. He trusted in God despite the circumstances and relationships he had to deal with, because think about it. Eli is trying to train him, teach him all the ways of being a priest. But then he see Eli's two sons. Remember I said these were some bad boys. Read it for yourself, all right? Because it, it has a lot of implications here, 1 Samuel 1 through 16, all right? But what I want us to focus on is what method is God using right now to train you? Are these individuals, are there individuals who inspire and challenge you with their integrity and love, or are you frustrated or disheartened by the difficult people around you? Are you able to see the benefits of the experience even when it's hard? Because it's easy to say, I'm not coming back to church. I'll just, I'll just look at Zoom, you know. Find other means of serving God because you feel disheartened. So if you are struggling today, wake up the line of your train of thoughts. Where is your trust engine taking you? If you are on the wrong track, the Bible has, the Bible has provided us a track switcher. There are scriptures to a assist us in our training because you know I look at the Bible as a training manual you know if you look at those acronyms B-I-B-L-E basic instructions before leaving earth we can't go anywhere unless we have followed that manual have you ever bought something from the store and it comes with you know it comes with manuals and stuff like this like I got a new cell, a cell phone yesterday and I had an idea how to Activate it, but I looked at the manual, okay? But sometimes when you don't look at the manual, all right, and you put it together, and then you look over here, you still got some extra screws and stuff like that. Have you all ever done that before? Oh, yeah. All right? You didn't follow the manual. You can't get ahead if you don't follow the manual, God's manual. There's a purpose for it, all right? So... And in, and, 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 and in this manual, there are all kinds of scriptures to assist you and support you no matter whatever you're going through. Think about everything that you've gone through. If we could open the Bible together, it may take a, some time, but if we search the scriptures, we could find an antidote for whatever you're going through. Did you know that? Were you aware of that? It's almost like a car manual, all right? You know, when you buy a new car, I don't know what that's like. And I, I only bought one new car in my life, all right? All of them are used cars, and, and the man, something happened to the manual, all right? The manual wasn't there. So I had to ask people, well, when this happened, what do you do, all right? But with the Bible, it gives you an outline of what needs to take place, okay? So think about this. Colossians 3, 2 tells us to set our minds on the things that are above, not on the things that are on earth. Set your mind on them, and then think about these things. It takes work to do, redirect your trust. 1 Timothy 6.12 says, Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called, and have confessed the confession of the presence of many witnesses. You wasn't called to stay here forever. Hell wasn't, supposed, wasn't made for us. But sad to say, sad to say, okay, Hebrews 10, 23 says, let us hold fast the confession of our faith without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. God has never let us down, church. 
God has never let us down. It's us who have let ourselves down. We put the manual down and forgot to pick it back up. Romans 5, 5 says, Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. When God went back to heaven, he left us with the comforter. If we seek guidance, guidance is there. If we don't seek guidance, mm, it happens. Kind of, kind of remind me of something that just came to my mind. When you pull up to the, the gas station, how many of you all put, what is that, 83 octane in your car? 89 octane? 83 octane is regular gas. How many of you all put regular gas in your car? All right. There ain't, ain't nothing wrong with that. Don't be ashamed of that. To be able to go to the gas station, that's a blessing. All right. How many of you all put that uh, 89 octane in your car? That's that mid-grade. All right. It, it runs. It still runs. How many of you all put that 93 octane in your car? All right. Just, I do it too, you know. But, you know, and, and, and you know what? The manual in my car says if I put 93 octane in there, it cleans out my injectors. You know what I'm saying? It's like a cleaning agent in there. All right? And like me, I'd rather put 93 octane and pay that 10 or 30 cent more than pay that $100 or $1,000 more if the car breaks down. You know? It's a preference. All right? Just like serving God, it's a preference, but it's consequences too. It's consequences. Romans 12, 3 says, For I say, through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one of us a measure of faith. You know, God is good, all right? And he's worthy to be praised daily, okay? So what does it mean to put on the whole armor of God? Because this is what we need to do this day and age, all right? Can you imagine uh, parents? You get a letter from Uncle Sam saying, hey, listen, I want your daughter to fight. All right, I don't have time for to send her to training. But I'll give her a gun, I'll give her a uniform, and I'll give her a cot and three meals a day. What do you think? No? Some of us are, that's some of our life. You know? Because, think about this, the armor of God represents the defense we must take in our spiritual lives. The Bible tells us that we are fighting a war against Satan, and believe you me, none of us are able to win. It's only through the grace of God. So therefore, we must take action and put on God's armor. As Christians, it is important for us to understand the severity of this battle. This is a battle of your mind. God is, to Satan is trying to control your mind. So think about all the avenues that are out there. All right? You got your manual, all right? And it's telling you those avenues out there. Let me see if I can help list some of them. Television, music, different type of foods, different type of people. Um, cars can be, material things can be. Are we aware of that? So sometimes we, you know, like this, I, I, this is a true story right here. I have an aunt that lives in Texas, right? Her, her son, and husband went to the beach, all right? Having a great time, all right? They was on these, you know, those little, what do you call them, little floater things that blow up, raft, rafts, rafts? Okay, they were out there. You know what, you know what an undercurrent is? Okay, an undercurrent got them. They was waving, you know, having a good time and everything. She was waving back at them. But the current was taking them further and further out. 
That's the last she saw of them. That's reality. Things like this happen. If you're not aware, sometimes we don't know how far life situations have taken us away from God. That's why it's so important that we stay in the word. The devil doesn't use things that ain't going to tempt you. All right? He's using things that are going to tempt you. That's going to make you think twice. I know on the, on the way to um, a church this morning, I was asking my wife, how, if drugs are so bad, if alcohol is so bad, if sexual transmitted diseases are so bad, why are people still becoming drug addicts, alcoholics, you know, uh, 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 coming up with these sexual transmitted diseases, these things are so bad? You can't diddle and daddle on the devil's grounds and not get caught. All right? You, church, we need to think. We really need to think. I'll be the first to say training for change in my life has been extremely difficult. Change is not easy. Have you all ever heard that the older you get, the harder it is to change? That's true. That's true because think about it. I have been going through training all my life, since birth. My mom and daddy tried to train me, train up a child on the way that it should go. In, high, in elementary school, middle school, high school, college, you know, trying to learn all this type of stuff. I learned how, I got a big bill, okay? Some of y'all didn't get that, okay? But it's okay, okay? But all these things, and I'm still in training. I'm still in training. You know, in, in, uh, before um, I teach the young adults class, we had a good time this morning. You know, uh, this is the class of individuals between the ages of 19 and in their 30s. I got tickled with the things that they're going through. You know what I'm saying? Trying to make ends meet. So uh, uh, Amanda said, I go to a job from 8 to 5. Then I got to come home and go to another job, being a mama, a wife, and all this type of stuff. She said, it never ends, you know, paying these, paying these mortgages, paying these rent and stuff like that. My son, Sean, I, I, just, I was just, there just laughing because I had a good time because they didn't know the reality of life until they have to experience it for themselves, you know. That's, that, that's, that's all of us, is that not? That's all of us. All right, but it life for these individuals is 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 holding them, is helping them to become accountable. All right, just like if we continue to study God's word, it helps us. It 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 it, it, it inspires us that when we have these moments, we're gonna be okay if we study His word. Is that not true? Okay, so the principle is that the right training produces the right results. So athletic teams, ballet, and stage productions, and armies train. They drill, 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 and over and over. And the purpose of this is to make sure that we understand what our responsibilities are. Okay, so the skill becomes an integral part of them that they perform that they perform well routinely. You think about some of you all are very responsible. You know? Some of you all don't know or have never experienced a repo man, right? Some of you all have never experienced a, a foreclosure, right? All right? Uh, some of us, or all of us, I'm gonna say all of us, because right, because the song says when we all get to heaven, right? What a day of rejoicing that's gonna be. Amen? So nobody in this room is going to hell, I would like to say. All right? But it's a choice. Amen? All right, let's continue on. So proper training will endure throughout life. That's what the Bible is all about, proper training. All right? So this principle also applies to what God is doing in a Christian's life. All right? 
People are material and we are mortal, but God puts his children through a training program to prepare them for eternal life. Okay? So he trains them in a way that will endure for all eternity. So when you run into these snags or these typhoons and stuff like that, there is a way out. All right, there is a way out. Do you have enough patience? Do you, you, do you depend on God enough to get you out of that? All right? So he trains them, us, in a way that will endure us for eternity. In dealing with eternal consequences, we understand why God uh, considers doctoring. Teaching instructions are so important. Our best hope, I, I, I found this quote this morning, all right? It says, our best hope for resisting Satan is to respond as Jesus did and anchor our thoughts in Scripture. Isn't that something? When in doubt, pull it out. You know? When in doubt, pull it out. That's all you got to do. Or know your Scriptures. Or sing a hymn. Or call his name. Can you all say Jesus? Just by you saying that he knows all about you. He knows what he needs to do, do next. But the point is, don't call him after you done tried everything. Okay? Call, let that be your first call. You know, it's just like um, when you, like yesterday, uh, I was trying to make a doctor's appointment. And sometimes it, 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 it get on my nerves, though. But, you know, like whenever you call the doctor's office, you know, the first thing they say, if this is a medical emergency, please hang up and dial 911. That's the first thing they say. Yeah. All right? So I'm saying when you are in doubt, when something isn't right, please dial Jesus. It's, 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 it's just that simple. Just think about how much easier your life would be. All right? So training determines what a person will become, and, and doctrine will determine what his people will become. Think about this, church. If a child is left to himself, where is his training coming from? Obviously, in this case, mom and dad are not having a great impact on their child. The training must be coming from society, most likely his, his friends and peers, right? So, the Bible says in Proverbs 22, 15, because foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child, and that's not just somebody that's between the ages of 1 and 10. Some individuals never grow up. Hint, hint, hint. Okay? All right? So, it says that a child left to himself brings shame. All right? Consequences. He is bound to get into trouble if his training is haphazard or undirected, or if he is not drilled on discipline, all right? So training is given, is given directions, is given corrections, is given instructions to steer the individual where he or she needs to go. The training, the teaching makes all the difference in this world. You know, you heard about somebody having a Midas touch? That's not just, that's for everybody. All of us can have the Midas touch if we just use the manuals. It's just that simple. So, I'm about ready to close. Like I said, I don't have a long message. You know, it never is, all right? So, let me say this. Everyone possesses the capacity to raise their level of training, all right? Let me say that again. Everyone possesses the capacity to raise their level of training. Each of us can improve ourselves in the way we influence others. Think about that, okay? We must begin with our perspective, and that is what makes the Bible so profound. The Bible is our training manual. It's about raising the lid on our accountability by first leading our lives and then the way we treat others. Those are two main things. If you can manage yourself, if you know how to treat others, you got it going on. I like this. One. That's, that's, that's a Russell phrase. You got it going on. You know, I like that. Russell says that a lot. You like that. You got it going on. You know? So, 
The Bible has all kind of instructions. It has all kind of examples, good and bad, all right? Teachable moments, using everyday situations to illustrate biblical principles and teach about God and faith. Because everybody in the Bible, let me tell you, there's some regular people in the Bible, okay? But those raggedy individuals, by putting their faith in God, they became some pretty sound individuals. So there is hope for us all, all right? Our influence has less to do with our position or title than it does with the life we live. It's not about position, but production. How productive are you? It is not, it's not about education, the, the education that we get, but the empowerment we give that makes a difference to others. All right? It's not about the words we say. It's our actions. Okay? It's our actions that says everything. You don't have to say nothing. Some people like you because of your actions. You cannot be liked because of your actions. You don't have to say anything. That's just, the, that's just human nature. That's just how we are. Okay? So, in training, in our training, the key word is credibility. How credible are you? We gain credibility when our life matches our talk and when both add value to others. So, I got... Five questions, all right? And just, just, just something for you to think about. Consistency. Are you the same person no matter who's with you? Talking about consistency. Choices. Do you make decisions based on how they benefit you or others? Credit. Are you quick to recognize others for their efforts when you succeed? Character. Do you work harder at your image or integrity? Which one is it, image or integrity? And the fifth one, the fifth and last question. Have you recognized that credibility is a victory, not a gift? That's something that we must know. Credibility is a victory, it's not a gift. So, in closing, God rightly expects us to train in order for accountability, to build relationships, and manage life situations wherever we are. Because there won't be any excuses. You know, it's almost like, how many of you all have ever taken an exam? Every hand should go up because all of y'all went to school and everything like that, still in school and everything like that. Y'all had an exam? A young person told me this morning, I had an exam this past week. I studied, and I still flunked it. How can that be? How can that be? You got the material. The teacher is coming for you. He's going to grade you on what you know, your actions. Will you pass or will you flunk? It's that simple. Let us pray. Our dear most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this day. Lord, we thank you so much for everything that you have given us, Lord. You've given us so much, Lord, that any and every situation that we come up against, Lord, there's a way out. Even when situations, circumstances happen that we don't understand, Lord, you told us to seek your face. So, Lord, I'm asking you to, for forgiveness for my sins, Lord, and I'm asking that you continue to work with all of us that are in this room and on Zoom today, Lord, because we have all fallen short of your glory and we need your saving grace. So, Lord, once again, forgive us, help us, and strengthen us. In your name we do ask and pray. Amen. Before I sit down, you know, um, um, I have to uh, do an appeal because, you know, we, things happen in our lives, okay? And 
we need to make sure that we're on point, okay? Uh, my appeal this morning is to make sure that each one of us have that relationship with God that we need, all right? Because you may not think that you need him. Any of y'all ever thought that you didn't need air? Anybody ever try to hold in their breath? Okay? You need God just like you need air, all right? So if there's anyone out there, you know your situation, you know your relationship with God, all right? He's there. He's just waiting. You know, two things that come to mind, and I'm, and I'm going to sit down. How long did Noah preach? How many years? 120 years. How many people was in the ark? How many? Eight. Okay. 120 years and only eight people? Come on now. The math, something's wrong with that math. Did the individuals not know that they needed God? But when those doors closed, how many people were trying to get in the ark? My next thought for you all, when the Israelites left Egypt, headed to the promised land, how many people was it? Can't count it, put it this way, you can't count them on your fingers, can you, and your toes, right? There was millions of people, right? Well, how many people went into the promised land? Huh? Was it two? Put it this way, you can count the number on one hand. All right? Church, you know your situation. I don't. But God knows your situation too. I'm just giving you two examples of many examples where God don't focus on the multitude. He focuses on the individual. Whosoever will, let him come. That's what God is doing. All right? So, wherever you are in your walk, if you know if you need Christ or not, this is your time. If not, if it's well with your soul, let us pray again. Our dear most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I've said what I need to say. I just pray, Lord, that where each individual we, all of us are in our life, Lord, is in the safety of your arms. Continue to work with us. Help us, Lord. Strengthen us for the battles that we have to endure, that we can lean on you and trust in your word. In your name we do ask and pray. Amen. Happy Sabbath, church.